Hi, it's Dr. Lori, the PhD Antiques Appraiser. I'm back with more real bargains. It's the objects, the bargains that people like you are finding at thrift stores, antique shops, and of course, flea markets and yard sales. Let's get started. I'm starting with jewelry. Everybody gave me permission to retell their stories. Jewelry is very hot. I've been telling you and teaching you how to find it, how to identify it. This piece is the first one. It is a chain and pendant of Jesus Christ. The halo, of course, the pains Jesus Christ. Christ pendant. This comes from a video call where one of my clients actually bought this on an online auction. So she bought an Italian jewelry lot. That's how it was described. An Italian jewelry lot for for two hundred dollars. She got thirty five pounds. Thirty five pounds. That's a lot of jewelry, right? Thirty five pounds of jewelry in this lot for two hundred dollars plus shipping. Okay, so that's a pretty good deal, right? Now you're thinking, okay, 35 pounds is gonna be kind of a lot. So that's what she ended up paying for it. She got this, she purchased it, and she said, I didn't know what I was gonna get, but you know, I sifted through everything. It's a lot of fun to sift through everything. It's like treasure hunting, it's great. So she bought the piece, she got all of these pieces, part of this larger lot, and um, I want to look, want you to really take a look at the piece. When I did the video call with her, she was very surprised to learn a couple of indicators of this piece. Yes, it was marked 14 karat gold. Okay, that's easy. The chain was marked and the pendant was marked. It's important that they were both marked, okay? So she got actually this piece within that large lot and it, the pendant said 14 karat and the chain said 14 karat. But I told her that the pendant was from one time period and the chain was from another time period. And this is important to know and you can identify it too. I'm going to teach you how. So if you look at the pendant itself, you'll notice that it is the pained, suffering face of Jesus. You can see he's wearing the crown of thorns. You can see also the halo, which is punched out at the back. You can also see, of course, the way in which it's a three-dimensional pendant of Jesus's head with the halo. There's a couple of things about this that say this piece is from the 1940s, okay? And it's an early piece of the 20th century because this piece is cast, it's hand cast. If you look at the back of it, you'll notice there's a lot of hand workmanship here too. They are not just cast and done out from the same mold. This one is hand cast and jewelry casting. So that's one of the things. You can see the very different and organic shaping of the back of the piece. And also you'll notice where it's marked 14K. The front shows the pained face. So it's really like a small little sculpture that's a pendant on your neck. The chain is different. The chain is also marked 14K, but the chain dates to the 1970s or 1980s. It's a link chain, it's quite heavy. And notice that this particular chain is quite heavy to go along with the very heavy or weighty casting of the gold pendant. It's important that you have the weightiness of the chain with the weightiness of the pendant. Putting it on a small chain, it may break the chain. Also, it doesn't really look as good. So you have to make sure that you have equal weight when you're wearing these pieces of jewelry. Just a tip. This piece she purchased in a 35 pound lot for $200. And this piece, 14 karat gold, both of them were $1,250 for the chain and the pendant. It's a real bargain for sure. And it's a real beauty as well. It's gorgeous. This next real bargain is also jewelry. I keep telling you about jewelry. I talk to you about what to look for, whether it's fine jewelry or costume jewelry. And don't forget that you want to have the testing mechanism, the things that you need to help test it. The first thing you need, you need the loop. You need the loop, identifying it by magnifying it. And you also need, of course, a gem tester. I have recommendations on my website at drlaurieV.com for, of course, gem and jewelry testers. The simple diamond tester is one of the things that's a must have. They're small, they're convenient, put it in your pocket, not, not difficult to have on your person. So don't forget about that. But this piece is a wonderful real bargain and it came from a video call. This client actually got this from an estate sale and she said, well, you know, I live in the rural areas. It, it was a local estate sale. I really liked this piece and I bought a bunch of pieces from the same person. I like this piece because it was gold and it was marked. So that was easy for me. She said, I also like this piece because I wasn't really sure if these were diamonds, but they sort of sparkled like diamonds. I told her she has to get the diamond tester, right? Because she's got to get the diamond tester to test the diamonds. Okay. So she said, well, I got this, this particular brooch for $2. $2 for this brooch, and I wasn't sure about the diamonds. 
I said, when I saw the brooch, I said, well, that brooch is a very typical bouquet brooch from the 1940s, 1950s. It's a nice bouquet brooch, and you'll notice that there are colorless stones set around these gold forms, these metal gold forms that are like flowers, like a bouquet. And those colorless stones on the outside do look like diamonds. So she tested them, and they were indeed diamonds. And the small ones are diamonds. They sparkle differently. Even here, you can see them. You can even identify it if you start to get familiar with how do you identify these things from photographs or also from videos. And that's going to be very important. I'm going to teach you how to do that too. If you look at the central stone, the central stone only has four prongs. And the number of prongs is very important. That stone has been replaced, and that stone is a colorless stone. It's, of course, a faux colorless stone. It is not a real diamond. So that brings back down the value some, but it also helps you to identify that that particular piece has been repaired at one point. So that stone looks to be a colorless stone and that, that stone is not a real diamond. It was tested and not a real diamond either. So that's an important point. But when you see four prongs instead of six prongs on a big stone like that, that potentially is a diamond, you know, a lot of fine jewelers are going to say, wait a minute, we need some more prongs in here. So that's an important tip for when you're looking at stones too. Count the prongs. It's a good tip. This piece from the 1940s was purchased for $2. That's right. It's a real bargain for sure. For $2, this piece is worth $400. $400 with the stone that isn't a real diamond, but those other diamonds and all that gold are making it worth its weight. Real nice, real bargain. This next real bargain comes from an estate sale, and it was from a video call. It's a 14 karat gold and Mobe pearl cluster pin. These are the pins that would be worn way up high on the shoulder. Sometimes they would be worn with a scarf, but usually pretty high up on the shoulder. Not here on a lapel, not on a jacket, you know, not like a brooch, but up here. 14 karat gold with a large Mobe pearl in the middle, in the center. It has dark garnets all the way around. And remember, garnets are darker than rubies. Rubies have more of a reddish color, darker. Garnets are darker, almost like maroon or darker color. So that's what you're seeing. Also seed pearls, makes it look quite beautiful. You can see it's a five pointed star shape and it's set in 14 karat gold. It's clearly marked. The seed pearls date the, help to date the piece to the 1920s to the 1930s. And it is, again, a statement kind of piece. It's a piece that would be sort of the end or the crescendo of an outfit. It's a nice piece. The other thing about this piece that I like is, again, the consistency of the shape. The shape is really pretty nice, and the shape is something that a lot of people will look for. So you have that nice, that nice idea of the shape being consistent, right? It's kind of symmetrical as you see it. So I like this piece a lot. It has a lot going for it. The large central pearl contrasts with the very small seed pearls as details, and the garnets give it this nice gold and then red and then white kind of color. Sometimes these star pins are also used for particular ceremonies. So in this particular case, it was just used as a statement piece and worn, as I said, on the top of the shoulder. So my client paid $2 for it. That's right, $2 for it. And it has a clasp, and I've talked to you about clasps in other videos. It has a clasp that dates the piece to the 1920s, 1930s. So that's important to look for too. She paid $2. What's it worth? $500. $500 for the amount of the gold as well, of course, as the design. And don't forget about designs when it comes to these pieces. When it comes to jewelry, particularly fine jewelry, a lot of people are saying, well, what is it for smelt weight? What if I just melt it down? You're going to lose the design value and you're going to lose the antique or age value on a piece if you decide to melt down a piece like this. So if you can help it, it's not a good idea to melt down some of these pieces. So it depends on the piece, but in this particular case, it's a beautiful real bargain at, and worth $500. This next real bargain is a brooch with some problems. It comes from a video call, and this piece was purchased at an estate sale, but it's broken. Now, a lot of you are going to ask me, well, Dr. Lori, it's broken. You're going to tell me how much it's worth with, when I say broken, it's missing a stone. Um, you're going to tell me how much it's worth without the stone. I want you to tell me how much it's worth with the stone. So I'll do that in just a second. It comes from a video call. It's pearls, it's garnets, and also, of course, set in 14 karat yellow gold. 
It's a very nice piece. A couple of things that are happening here. It had some enamel around it. If you look at the sides, you can see where the enameling was done. A little bit of black outline to make it sort of look like more of a contrast between the gold and of course the black and then the garnets. The garnets are pretty large. Now another tip for those of you who love jewelry, garnets are very popular in the early 1900s from about 1900 until 1940. Almost the whole, almost until World War II, about 1941, 1945. So from that time back to 1900, garnets are big and they even have synthetic garnets during this time period. So you're going to see a lot of different type of garnets coming out. It's because they're large and it's because they are naturally developed stones and there's an abundance of garnets at this particular time. So lots of people are wearing garnets. They're beautiful and these are big and these are faceted. Contrasting with the small faux pearls throughout this whole decoration, and you'll notice it is a floral decoration, curved elements, as well as that nice enameling that you have in this piece. It's a great piece. Well, the story was that my client went to a local estate sale and she saw all of this, these pieces of jewelry and she said, well, I remembered some of the things you said, Dr. Lori, and I thought, well, I don't really wear brooches, but they could be valuable, so I'm gonna take a, I'm gonna take a stab at it. She said, I didn't wanna pay too much for any of them because I wasn't really sure. She said, this one was very hard to find the actual mark. I only found it after I got home. So that was kind of interesting. During the video call together, we were able to find it. She said, yes, yes, I found it once I got home. So this, she wasn't able to find it at the estate sale. And it's difficult sometimes to find things at an estate sale. So I always suggest to you this little trick, wear a magnetic bracelet when you're going to these estate sales and thrift stores because the magnetic bracelet will help you to identify, of course, what's gold, what's not. Gold is not magnetic, so it won't stick to your bracelet. But if you have one, you've got one of those magnetic bracelets on, you can actually put the metal, maybe it's a piece of jewelry, up to your bracelet and see whether or not it sticks. It'll help you to identify if you have real gold or not. It's one of the easiest tricks in the book. So I hope you think about that. I have recommendations for that on my website. This idea, too, is something that I want you to think about but this this particular brooch a beautiful example a wonderful example even with the missing stone because that garnet could be replaced probably for only between 40 and 60 dollars you could replace that particular stone it's not that big garnets are not all that expensive to replace it's faceted it's an easy oval form so it's not like it's an unusual form that particular piece I think would be an easy replacement in its current condition my client paid $2 for it. It's from the 1950s, but in fact, it's worth $400 if it had the replacement garnet. Without the replacement garnet, it's worth $200. Bucks. So a real bargain all the same. Might mean a little bit of work. Some people would wear it without the garnet being replaced, but I think replacing the garnet is a good idea. My next real bargain comes from a video call, and you all know about my video calls. You can call and have objects appraised by me, talk with me, ask me those questions on a video call. So this client did a video call with me, and she had gone to a thrift store, and she said, you know, Dr. Lori, I walked by this piece when I first saw it. I went to my local thrift store. I go there pretty frequently, and I was looking around. I like ceramics, and I looked at this piece, and I thought, I don't really think so, and I walked by it. And then I thought, wow, you know, Dr. Lori's been talking about Native American pieces. Maybe I should go back and take a second look at that. So she went back, she took another look at it. It's a pretty big piece and it's ceramic. And she said, I took another look at it and then I turned it over to the bottom and I saw the mark and the mark said Hopi bird. I didn't really know what that meant, but I thought, well, it is marked and it kind of reminds me of something that I've seen on the channel right here with me. So she said, well, I thought, let's go see what they want for it. So she went up to the the clerk and the clerk said, well, $10. And she said, well, Dr. Lori tells me to negotiate. I always tell you to negotiate. You should always negotiate. Ask, be polite, ask, it can't hurt. So my client said, will you take eight for it? And the woman said, yeah, I'll take eight for it. She got it for eight, did a video call with me and I was happy to tell her it's worth $450. It's worth it to negotiate. It's worth it to have a video call with me. $450, it's a nice piece. What is it? It's clearly marked. It's a Hopi bird piece. It's Pueblo pottery. It's made in Arizona. It's of Native American style. And you can see, of course, the nice form of the vase itself. And you can also see what's called the form line art. Very, very abstracted image of birds. Really a beautiful work and a nice piece representing the Hopi, of course, people. This next real bargain is really a wonderful piece and a piece that really speaks to the history, of course, of the opera. So 
This piece is a Chinese fan and it's in a frame. And this piece was a piece that actually goes back to an uh, opera singer, very famous one, in the 1920s and 30s from Italy. She was an opera singer who made her mark in Chicago. And she sang at the Chicago Opera House for years and years. And this piece is a wonderful example of, again, a thrift store find. The opera singer's name was Emilita Galli Curry, and she lived from 1882 to 1963. And she was at the Chicago Opera House, and she recorded many, many recordings, and she was a person of the day, you know, in the early 1900s. She, in fact, used to use this fan, which she bought in the port of Canton, China, when she traveled there singing, of course, opera. She bought this fan there, and then she would use it when she performed Madame Butterfly at the Chicago Opera House. And she performed it from 1916 to 1924 in Chicago. So this fan was on the stage many, many times, and it was done during a very famous scene of hers, which was, of course, in Madame Butterfly, it was called the bridge scene. So what happened was this piece gets given to the stage manager who always handed her the fan every night when she would go on to perform. The stage manager kept it for many, many years, and when, when um, Emilita left the Chicago Opera House to go to the Metropolitan Opera, she said as a parting gift, she gave him the fan. So his family had always kept the piece. My client found it in a thrift store. The piece was obviously given away and donated to a thrift store, and my client found it on, with a video call. He told me about it, and there was a detailed note on the back. The detailed note on the back told about the provenance. It's very important. I told my client, hold on to the detailed note because this is going to tell you the whole story. He was able to actually find the Madame Butterfly um, pictures of that particular performance with her holding the fan, which is what increases the value. A beautiful example, and that's a wonderful piece. It's been preserved pretty well. Of course, it is made of ivory, and then it also has, of course, all of that lace. It's a beautiful piece, and it relates to the history of the, of the traditional American opera. Value on the piece, oh, I forgot to tell you what he paid. My client paid $20 for it at the thrift store, and with the frame, it's worth $250. It has, of course, stage or theater collectability, as well as, of course, the history of the opera. A wonderful work, a wonderful work, and a great real bargain. This next real bargain comes from a video call, too. Um, this woman sent me in a picture, and she did a video call, and this painting is one that she found at a thrift store as well. It's a Hudson River School painting, and a good one at that. A Hudson River School painting, a landscape painting that shows you a couple of figures in the beautiful, of course, untamed landscape of the Hudson River School style. Hudson River School style paintings, very, very popular. They're made in America, and they're made in the 19th century. This one is 32 by 28. It's in gorgeous shape, and it's in its original frame. The piece was on sale at the thrift store. It was $29.99, and my client walked by it. And she thought, I don't care about this. I don't think this is something I want. Then she got home and she thought about it. And the weekend went by and Monday morning came and she drove back to the thrift store hoping that it would be there because she thought about it the whole time. This will tell you. If you're thinking about it, go with your gut. Buy it while you're there. Don't waste the gas going back and forth. Buy it while you're there. So she went back and she was so happy because it was still there. It was still there and she said, okay, well, you want $29.99 for it. It's been sitting there. Now it's been sitting there a couple extra days because I waited, right? She told me. And she said, I offered $20 and they took it. I told her it's worth $750 and it's a real bargain too. It's a beautiful landscape. Look at those clouds. It's a real bargain. I hope you find your real bargain soon. I'm Dr. Lori. I'll see you next time.